Hey, it's Guy Raz here, and welcome to The Great Creators. This is the place where I have conversations with some of the most celebrated actors, musicians, and performers of our time. And on the show today, filmmaker Eric Good. He had just lost the governor race in Oklahoma. We were there the night that he lost. He barely had any votes. And the next day, he disappeared. Poof. He left his zoo. Eric is probably best known for conceiving of and directing the hit show Tiger King, which became one of the most watched Netflix shows ever at the start of the pandemic. But it was never supposed to happen that way. Eric was originally filming a documentary detailing the lives of quirky exotic animal owners like Joe Exotic. But the story took an unbelievable turn into a true crime story when Joe Exotic hired a hitman to kill animal rights activist Carol Baskin. I'll let Eric tell the rest. So without further ado, enjoy this conversation with the director of Tiger King and Chimp Crazy, Eric Good. My family had a what we called a family ranch, um, which my grandfather had bought in uh, about 1930. Um, and so it was a place for my family to go uh, every summer. And so I spent every summer in Sonoma and I had a, a kind of feral uh, existence as my mother likes to describe it. Um, we were just, um, you know, uh, kids that just, you know, had no tether. We, we, um, there was nothing structured. We just played in the creeks and the, uh, fields and catch, you know, caught snakes and lizards and salamanders. And, and that was my summers for much of my life. Tell me about your relationship with animals. Well, so, um, my father was a, a teacher, uh, of art and art history and English and, he somehow couldn't keep a job for very long. So the longest we ever lived in one place was about three years. So the one stable uh, place was Sonoma and this ranch where we summered. And every summer, you know, my my escape was to connect with animals. And um, we were lucky enough to have a beautiful creek that ran through uh, the ranch. And we had native steelhead and pond turtles and red leg frogs and things that today I, you know, I took them for granted back then. Most of those animals are no longer there. They've since disappeared. Um, but I connected with animals as a kid um, because I was, I don't know, maybe a little bit of a loner as a, as a kid growing up. And so I spent endless hours fishing for trout and um, just spending time in nature. Um, you know, I didn't grow up, as I said, with any structure. There was no tennis classes or um, summer school. Um, my, you know, upbringing was mostly connecting with wildlife. Um, and so, you know, I had an informal relationship with animals my whole life. I never had any kind of accolades or degrees. Um, I wasn't good enough in math to become a biologist. Um, so it was it was really a hobby that I uh, and a through line that I never lost. And and particularly tortoises, right? <laughs> yeah, I gravitated to reptiles, uh, you know, snakes, lizards, uh, turtles and tortoises. And for whatever reason, um, you know, my mother didn't like me killing things. Uh, so keeping snakes and feeding them rats and, and we had pets, pet rats growing up wasn't something she liked. Um, and she didn't like me keeping things in cages. And so uh, she always would say, Eric, you know, you, you can't play God, you know, animals belong in the wild. So she would let me keep an animal over the summer and then I'd have to release it at the end of the summer. But turtles and tortoises lend, lent themselves to sort of coexisting in the garden without a cage. And somehow, and they didn't eat rats and mice, um, mostly vegetarian. So I gravitated to turtles and tortoises, primarily tortoises. And, you know, and I, I forgot to mention, my parents gave me a tortoise as a pet when I was six years old, a Mediterranean tortoise that they named Ajax after the god, not after the detergent. Um, and I just doted over Ajax and I would take Ajax on the plane, Pan Am, across the United States to New York and back to California. And the stewardess would always bring me lettuce to feed my 
tortoise on the tray flying across the country. Those days are long gone. But I um, had a pet tortoise, and it had obviously an indelible mark on me. Um, obviously, we're going to be talking about, and, and on this show, virtually everybody we talk to is an actor or a musician, and so you're a little bit unusual because <laughs> you got into um, the world of filmmaking um, later in your career. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment, but I'm, I'm curious uh, to for you to kind of talk a little bit about about your career, because from what I understand, you moved to New York as a young man to go to art school, um, but you eventually dropped out and and got into the world of of nightclubs. Tell me, tell me what you were, what you thought you were going to do when you got to New York as a as a student. Did you think you would become a designer or an artist? Was that the idea? Yeah, I thought I would. I guess become a fine artist. Um, my father, being an art teacher, you know, taught me everything there was to know. It seemed about contemporary art, um, and took me to museums and galleries, and um, you know, and really encouraged me to be an artist, um, and really encouraged me not to be in business of any kind. You know, money was the enemy for him as was the status quo. So doing something different was really important. Um, and he idolized people like Andy Warhol, and so did I. So going to New York and going to Parsons was the plan. Um, I didn't last long at Parsons because I kind of felt like I'd already knew everything. And of course I didn't, but at the time I thought that I did. Um, and I recognized very quickly in New York that um, being, you know, in my early 20s that, you know, where the action was in New York was at clubs and places like Studio 54 were bubbling up and the Mud Club and, and, and the artists were gravitating to these clubs. And so I thought, you know, what better a place to create art in a way, create happenings um, like you know, the happenings of the 60s, but put them in the context of a nightclub and make them even more elaborate. Um, and so I just figured that I could merge, you know, sort of my creative, um, whatever creative dreams I had, I could realize them through a nightclub. Um, and I eventually found money and became a connoisseur of nightclubs in New York. And at the time, in the, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, New York City was really the only place in the country where you could pull off the kind of nightclub that I wanted to do. Los Angeles was, um, you know, a, a town that went to bed early and people had dinner parties at home and the rest of the country just didn't have the urban density uh, and the art culture of New York. So New York was the only place that this could happen. And so that's what I did. I opened a club in 1983 called Area and it was overnight an instant success. And what, describe what made it so different. I mean, I know you described it as an art nightclub. What, what, what did that mean? Like visually, what, what did you experience when you would walk in? Well, you know, art, the word art is such a loaded word. I actually never described it or tried not to describe it as an art nightclub. But it was, you know, it was a place where I really wanted to, in many ways, make fun of the art world. But at the same time, you know, we wanted to shock people. We wanted to, um, you know, we um, we wanted to surprise people. We wanted to um, uh, do something that we thought had never been done before. And so the concept of the club was constant flux. Um, so we thought if we changed the entire interior of the club uh, every six weeks, people would feel like they're going to a new club. Uh, every six weeks. And so we would reinvent the entire place, you know, every month, every six weeks, and we would have different themes. Some were more esoteric, some were more, um, you know, some were, the, one theme would be the color red, and the next theme would be the theme that was more literal, like natural history or suburbia. Um, and so we'd mix it up. Uh, we did do a theme once that was called art, um, and we brought in many of the contemporary artists of that time in New York City, Andy Warhol to Jean-Michel Basquiat, young and old, um, David Hockney, Keith Haring, Robert Maplethorpe. And um, 
we kind of did it tongue in cheek because we also brought in artists that were not considered to be, you know, sort of on that pedestal as some of these other artists. So we brought in low art and high art and illustra illustrators and unknown artists and outsider artists. Um, so we mixed it all together. And um, I don't know if anyone really understood that we were trying to be playful and make fun of the art world, but that's what we were trying to do. We brought in Peter Max and Leroy Neiman, who is an illustrator for Playboy, but along with Andy Warhol uh, and some of these contemporary artists. But um, yeah, I use the word art loosely um, because I don't know how else to describe it. Um, and people have described it as the art nightclub. Yeah, I'm just trying to just trying to kind of imagine here you are running a nightclub in, in New York in the early 80s. And you get all these artists like Basquiat and, and Warhol, Keith Haring. I was just in Pisa in Italy and saw this magnificent Keith Haring mural that he, he painted in that town. Um, you know, uh, David Hockney. And I, I'm thinking to myself, like, how in the hell did you manage to get all those people to agree? Like, was was the world just different at that time where all those people would say, sure, yeah, I'll do it. Because today you'd have to go through like 17 layers of publicists and PR reps and, you know, all these different hurdles to get one of them there. Yeah, it's funny you say that. Well, you know, you have to remember that um, people like Jean-Michel and Keith Haring and Kenny Scharf and, um, you know, Francesco Clemente and those people were my contemporaries. We were all hanging out together. None of us had any money. And we were showing art together. At that time, I was making art, um, you know, so we would, I remember Keith Haring. What were you, tell me what you were doing. I was doing pieces that were kind of similar to what Damien Hirst did 10 years later. I would use uh, taxidermy and, and natural history um, as sort of the theme and build these um, display cases with objects in them, whether it's human skulls or, you know, a, a taxidermied pig or um, black crows. And I would do these assemblages that were sort of lar like large Cornell pieces. Um, and, and that grew into, you know, sort of more macabre uh, ideas. Like I started breeding flies, house flies, and pinning them uh, and making sort of uh, designs out of flies um, and, and insects, but especially flies where I'd make these kind of geometric patterns. Um, and, you know, and Keith Haring put together a show in 1981 at the Mud Club and I was in that show, and I think I remember my piece was etch -a sketches uh, that, of course, are ephemeral. But I, my piece sold first, and I was so excited, and Jean-Michel's piece didn't sell. Um, but we were all wow. in that show together, Jean-Michel wow. Basquiat, Kenny Scharf, and we were all grew up together So in New York City. So um, we were all trying to make a mark. And wow. conversely, Andy Warhol at the time was in a slump. And so he wanted to be a part of the younger scene. So to get everyone to come and participate in the context of a nightclub, all you had to say to the young kids was, you know, Andy's going to be involved. And all you had to say to Andy Warhol was Jean-Michel was going to be involved. Wow. And everyone came. Did you, could you have imagined back then, I mean, you're talking about people, I mean, you're talking about artists whose work I mean, Warhol was, of course, already rich and famous, but, you know, Basquiat and probably Herring, I mean, their, their work sells for tens of millions of dollars today, right? And and I think when Basquiat died, he I don't think he was wealthy, a wealthy man yet. What, what was, I mean, if you had gone back in time then and said, look, these, this is going to be some of the most prized art in the world in like 20 years, would you have been surprised? <laughs> Well, I always liked Jean-Michel's work, um, and Jean-Michel and I were, you know, very close um, for a number of years. He he went out with my sister for a number of years, um, and she got addicted to heroin along with him. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we didn't think like that back then. We didn't think about money and, and art as a commodity. We thought of art yeah. as ideas, and so... I remember when we did the, the art theme at Area 
at the end, we took sledgehammers and broke down the huge, beautiful Keith Haring mural that he had painted, and we threw it in the dumpster. We painted over the Hockney uh, <laughs> swimming pool that he did. We threw everything away. I remember throwing away one of Jean-Michel's pieces and um, never thinking that you know this would be something that we would commodify later. Um, so we didn't think like that. It, it was a very... You know, it, we thought of everything as being ephemeral. Yeah, I mean, it, it and 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 arguably a much better time. I mean, that you're a New York, like I, I probably Madonna was hanging out with you, like early, you know, before she became world famous. You know, it was just a different time in New York. I remember Madonna at a bar called Lucky Strike, where she was bartending. Sure, um, it was a different time, and no one had any money, um, at least in the downtown culture of Manhattan, and. Uh, yeah, it, it, you know, the, the word downtown, when we think of that word today and think of downtown Manhattan, it meant something very different, you know, 40 years ago. Right. Now it's like the financial district and yeah. right, expensive I mean, loss. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, to, I mean, you, you would go on to kind of get into the, the world of hotels and becoming a hotelier. Um, was it clear to you that you were not going to be able to make a living off art, that you wouldn't? that that wasn't going to be able to sustain a life? You know, I just realized that I didn't want that solitary life um, of, you know, sort of the cliche of being an artist in your garret, you know, painting away by yourself. I just realized that I would have been, um, you know, a fake. It, 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 it didn't call me in a way that other things did. So, um, you know, I dabbled with art in the for a number of years and then i um decided that you know i i was interested in especially at that age guy when you're young you want to meet you know the opposite sex in my case and you want to um, have fun and you what better way of doing that than you know putting it all into a, a social atmosphere like a nightclub and bring people together and of course, those in those days, you know, we didn't have cell phones or the internet. And so that was our way of connecting. And nightclubs at the time were kind of like, you know, laboratories for artists to exchange ideas. And um, it was a very fertile landscape in New York, um, you know, nightlife and its relationship to the creative world. And so for me, that was more fun and more interesting than making arts in a solitary way. Um, and then the leap to hotels was really not terribly interesting. It was more about stability and the, just the nature of nightlife in New York is that it's um, ephemeral. And a nightclub, you're really doing well if it lasts two years and it's great. You know, that's a great run. I, I know very few clubs in New York City that it were ever really great after the two year mark. And that includes Studio 54 and the most famous clubs. Um, you know, they, they have a short lifespan. And so hotels was the opposite. It meant stability. I could, you know, make sure I had some money because um, nightclubs was certainly not the way to do it. Um, it's interesting because you, you sort of the way you described the world you're, you were in was, I mean, you used the word ephemeral and you talk about, um, you know, sort of these young artists who really weren't thinking about their work as commodities and nobody was thinking about money. And I think all that's true. I think that's a reflection of how it was. But of course, you would go on to become very successful as a businessman. How do you explain that? I mean, do you think you just had an instinct for it or a knack for it? Or was it you just got lucky or what? Because the way you describe yourself as like this you know, kind of a flighty, just guy hanging out with a bunch of people making art, and yet you would go on to have a really successful career in in the business world. Well, wait, I, 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 I maybe I forgot part of that story. No, no, we worked very hard. We worked incredibly hard when we had nightclubs, um, and we worked very hard building hotels. We had incredible work ethic, um, and still do. Um, and we recognized that if we wanted to make a mark and do something really good, we had to do something really different. And we had to do it in a way that we felt no one else had done it before. And so that was true with 
area, which was my first real club in New York City. Um, and, it, and I think as, when we transitioned to hotels, you know, the way I build hotels is probably very different than most people because for better or worse, I do most of it, you know, with my partners ourselves. So it's got our fingerprints all over it. We don't usually hire outside designers. We don't, you know, have lots of consultants. We do it all ourselves. We do the restaurants ourselves. We run them ourselves. We design them ourselves for the most part. And that's certainly not a good recipe. Um, I wouldn't recommend it uh, for most hoteliers, but it did make the hotels feel very personal um, in the end. And I think that had a lot to do with the success of my hotels. They didn't feel corporate. So you, so you basically, you, you have this career um, building hotels, whereas you still are, are in, the, in, that, in that world. And I guess around uh, 20 or so years ago, you start to dabble in film and really 15 years ago in earnest. Tell me how that started. How did, how did you start to get into making documentaries? Well, it, it did start before that, but I, you know, I, one of the classes I loved in high school was a film class. So we would make my brother and I super eight films and we would make, you know, 90 minute super eight films, which were absurd. Um, and you know, so it started very young. And then when I first moved to New York city, one of my first jobs was driving around Marcello Mastriani which was a film by a director named Marco Ferrari, and it had Gerard J. Pardieu in it. Um, and I just sort of got in working on films, you know, as a PA and a location scout. So I had this sort of very tangential sort of experience working on films in the late 1970s and early 80s. Um, my best friend's father uh, did Saturday Night Fever, um, he was the line producer. So when I moved to New York, we were working on Saturday Night Fever. We worked on Hair. We worked on Ragtime, a lot of Milos Forman films. Um, and I hated it back then. But mm. um, in the 90s, I went back into film and started directing music videos for bands like Nine Inch Nails. Um, and I actually really loved it. And, and that was because, you know, for the first time, like it was for me in high school, I could do what I wanted. And, and so more recently, the idea of filming again came about because um, hotels for me had become somewhat formulaic and uh, a bit redundant. And um, I was never, as I said, my father always told me, you know, just don't make money, which, you know, of course, later in life, I realized was bad advice because I, I needed money to be able to, you know, do do things that I wanted to do. Not that I wanted to buy expensive cars or clothing, but I needed money to be able to actually make a difference in the world and do and do things that were creative. So I had been traveling all over the world in pursuit of my turtle conservation work. And I remember a meeting where I was meeting with a producer one day and I said, you know, I really should film some of the people I'm filming around the world. Um, and one of those people was a, a famous reptile smuggler who is sort of known as the Pablo Escobar of reptile smuggling in Asia. And, you know, my producer friend said, well, how are you going to make a documentary without getting killed? Um, but one thing led to another with my travels around the world and I eventually uh, decided to start filming with a proper crew because I'd been filming badly uh, using a little Sony video camera and all the footage was pretty terrible. So I eventually ramped up and that was probably about 18 years ago. And mm. I just started filming this world that I was involved in, which were animal people. And, and what was the, the intention? I mean, was the intention maybe I'll do something with it one day? Well, it was very loose at first. And then I thought, you know, maybe I'd make one film on the extinction crisis, um, which was really what I was covering. I was filming, you know, the guy that owns the most rhinos in South Africa in the world. I was filming, you know, monkeys that were being bred for medical research in 
Mauritius. I was filming um, in Indonesia people that were collecting butterflies for the butterfly trade and birds. So I was just filming all different aspects of, you know, sort of this this extinction crisis that we're in today, the sixth extinction, the first man-made extinction. Um, and, you know, to make it a short story, one day, um, a producer friend of mine that had some of the footage showed it to CNN. He had just done a film with Leonardo DiCaprio and CNN had passed on that film, I believe. And he showed CNN some of this footage and they said, oh, we're interested in that footage. You know, who's this guy? And so I, the next thing I knew, I was making a pilot for CNN um, where I was the host, um, which I never thought was something I wanted to do and still isn't. But, um, and it was a series about, um, you know, the, our relationship, humans' relationship with animals, whether it's collecting animal for exotic pets or consuming animals or wearing animals like exotic furs or hunting animals like big trophy hunters do. It was a, a theme, a show on CNN that would be covering our relationship with the animal world. We made one pilot, and at the time, CNN had enough, I think, middle-aged white men Anthony Bourdain was still alive at the time, and uh, they decided not to go forward with the show. So um, I was disappointed, but I, you know, pulled myself back up, and eventually uh, that's what led into the making of Tiger King, where the uh, s sort of what I was filming that I didn't shoot for CNN, and um, I always saved the Joe Exotic story, and, never, and that wasn't part of the CNN pilot. So that became Tiger King. All right, so let's let's talk about that. I mean, you were it, it, first of all, your approach initially when you were when you were gathering this footage, you didn't have a story. Like a lot of documentary filmmakers, right? They'll have the story outlined, and then they will go match that story with pictures, right? And I was in television many years ago, and oftentimes I'd say you make a TV story, you have an idea, and then you go match the pictures. Or you've got a framework, right? And oftentimes you have a sense of how it's going to end. But it seems like you, you really were just gathering a bunch of stuff waiting for the story to emerge. And, and, and the story that eventually would emerge was this guy that you, you, you ended up filming, Joe Exotic. Is that, is that how it kind of – is that how it unfolded? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I would never recommend to anyone that this is a smart way to make documentaries. <laughs> it's a crazy way to make documentaries. It's amazing, but it's crazy. Yeah, it's definitely not. Um, yeah. Anyway, yes, I cast a very wide net guy and filmed many different subcultures of this crazy animal world. And, you know, like I said, I was filming all over the world. Um, thinking I'd sort of, you know, somehow put a, one documentary together about, you know, our perverse relationship with the, you know, the animal world. Um, and it really started, uh, my focus was really the reptile world. And I was filming in South Florida, reptile smugglers, reptile dealers, sort of the breaking bad of the reptile world. And somewhere along the way, and I think this is chronicled in Tiger King. Um, yeah. A guy showed up with a snow leopard in the back of his van and trying to buy some venomous snake, snakes at this reptile dealer's place. And that sort of perked my interest. Like, how can you just buy a snow leopard in South Florida? <laughs> and that sort of was the, the, the turning point into the big cat world. And I started filming big cat people and most of them, uh, were not terribly interesting or, you know, they actually were interesting, but anyway, yeah. I, I kind of, you know, as time went on, it, it started getting narrow into Joe exotic and Carol Baskin and the characters that are in tiger King. And yes, um, I, I never thought in my wildest imagination that while I was filming that something as crazy as Joe trying to kill Carol, would take place contemporaneously with filming. And so, you know, when I found out that that's what was happening, it was one of the most um, mind-boggling things. I, I'll never forget it. Um, 
you know, we'd been filming Joe for a number of years in Oklahoma and his zoo and his 200 tigers. Um, and one day, and we're filming simultaneously Carol Baskin in Florida and her big cat rescue. And we're filming some other characters, Doc Antle in South Carolina, another big cat person. And I couldn't figure out why Joe Exotic was leaving his zoo. He had just lost the governor race in Oklahoma. We were there the night that he lost. He barely had any votes. And the next day he disappeared, poof, he left his zoo. And I just thought there's something missing here. Why would he build this zoo 20 years later, just walk away from it? And then about a month later, I found out, I, I went to the zoo and the guy that had inherited the zoo, Jeff Lowe, told me that Joe had hired hitmen to kill Carol Baskin. And it all, suddenly, it all made sense. And um, I was blown away. And I, it was like one of those amazing things that happens when you're filming a documentary. And of course, it's gold. As much as it was horrible, it was just the most incredible, you know, gift in a way that that would happen. And um, yeah, and, and of course, the pandemic happened. And who could have planned that? So we had a captive audience when Tiger King dropped. Um, and so I never thought that I would even make a penny filming all these animal people. And it wasn't my goal to make money. And it wasn't my goal to be, you know, to create a Tiger King, but it happened. It's such a compelling story, and he's such a compelling character. Um, I, I wonder how you I, – I, I, watching that documentary, I, th I constantly thought to myself, there must have been so many moments in making – and filming him where you thought, this isn't going anywhere, or this is too weird, or I don't think I could do anything with this, or I might be wasting my time. And if you did have those feelings, how did you – justify doing this work to yourself? How did you say to yourself, no, I got to keep going? <laughs> oh, God. You know, when I did the CNN pilot, I was connected with a production company to, to you know, that would produce that show and a budget. Um, and they gave us something like five days of shooting. And I said, this is impossible. You can't make a show, you know, an hour long show with five days of shooting. And of course, when we made that pilot, I added 30 days more of shooting without the production company knowing. But in the making of Tiger King, we just filmed when we thought, you know, whenever we thought we might be missing something or possibly missing a moment, um, you know, even the most tangential character we wanted to film. So of course, in the end, I would say half the characters we filmed never made it into the show, if not more, um, which is disappointing for the, for, you know, of course the people you film, um, it's very frustrating, but, uh, it's like I said before, it's not a recipe to make money, uh, making Tiger King. Cause I can't even tell you how many days of shooting that took. And, you know, of course it spanned, um, over five years, the making of Tiger King. Um, yeah. But it's not a recipe that I would follow. Um, I, I can tell you, because I know right now that the, the, our new show that's coming out on HBO about chimpanzees um, also took about four years to film. And I know that we shot for over 200 days, um, I think it was 230 day, film days to make four episodes, you know, 60 minute episodes uh, on this chimp uh, story, and that yeah, you know, most people can't do that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just going back to, to Tiger King for a moment before we talk about the the new documentary. Do you have an estimate, a rough estimate, of how many hours of film you you captured over those five years? Yeah, I I don't, but it's it's um, it would be st you know. It, it, to any production company, it would not make sense how much we filmed, as I said. Like thousands of it's, hours? It's thousands of hours. It's thousands of hours. How thousands. do you process that? How do you even go through that and log it and stay on top of it and remember what you have and what you want to use? And I can't even imagine how you organize 
that in your mind. I don't. I forget. And it's very frustrating. What you realize is that you could have made so many different combinations of characters that actually would have worked. And you just have to make a decision in the end. But it's a really good question. I mean, Tiger King, I think there was just a, a point where, you know, the general public was fed up with Tiger King. They, they had overdosed on Tiger King. Um, and we were asked to make a second Tiger King uh, during the pandemic, which we did. Um, and it was amazing that the story just kept going, um, kind of mind blowing to me that it just kept going. But I think there's a saturation point for the public. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is we could have kept making episodes of Tiger King. There was so yeah. much, there was so much great material and so many incredible characters. If you don't mind me asking, what is your relationship with Joe Exotic like now? That's a good question. Um, I haven't spoken to Joe since he was in prison during the trial. I would speak to him, uh, you know, before he was convicted. So I haven't spoken to Joe for quite some time. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, I sat in the courtroom every day while he was, you know, uh, in federal court, um, you know, and the government had given him a, a, a plea deal, which had he taken it, he would be out of prison today. I think they offered him six years or something, six or seven years, but he was so bullish that he was going to win. Um, and so delusional. Um, so the, my last conversations were with Joe were just having to, you know, listen to him talk, tell me about how he was, um, you know, not going to get convicted. So it's quite sad, you know, that he didn't take that deal and he's going to be in prison, you know, unfortunately, I, I, you know, for another, however long it is, I think his sentence was about 22 years. So he's done what, six or so years, um, you know, he'll be 80 or whatever he'll be if he gets out. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. Joe did a lot of really bad things, but I don't think the sentence fully fits the crime. Um, but I haven't talked to Joe. Of course, had Tiger King not come out, Joe would have never have received the attention and the interest from lawyers that would, that are working for him today. So it was very positive for Joe, but I don't think Joe looks at it that way. Yeah. Tell me, um, you have a new documentary out called Chimp Crazy and, and also a compelling main character named Tanya Haddix. Um, and this is a, basically about people who uh, are obsessed with and keep chimps as pets. Um, what is it about these kinds of characters that draws you to them? I mean, all of the people that you had in Tiger King, the people in Chimp Crazy, um, you know, I don't want to be judgmental about <laughs> about people in any way, but they're 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 quirky. They're they're eccentric. You know, they are. I mean, they ha you have to be. Even Carol Baskin, who's an interesting person for sure. That they're all, um, you know, they're they're different. <laughs> How can I say it? <laughs> okay. And they make compelling characters, right? For sure. Yeah. What is it about them that draws you to to really? study them because I guess you could make an argument and I'm not making this argument, but one could make the argument that, well, they're just easy targets because they're so weird. Yeah. I mean, that's true. You could, you could say they're easy targets and therefore, you know, I'm exploiting them because um, they don't know better. I really, that's a real balancing act for me um, because you know, this world, this animal world, I f should first say, largely it's very guarded. Um, they don't, many people in the animal world don't let people in easily. Um, they worry that you're the federal government t wanting to take their animals away. They wor worry that you're an animal rights activist. They worry that you're going to steal their animals. So there are all kinds of worries. Um, and so they're very guarded. Um, but to answer your question, your earlier question about what attracts me to this world, you know, I'm interested in the animal world, but this is really something more than just the animal world because it's about finding people that, you know, really 
march to the beat of their own drum and live a life that, you know, uh, that we in New York City or in San Francisco were not aware of, of, of these worlds. And I've always been interested in outsider art, but also people that do things um, completely outside of the mainstream and, and the sort of the world that we know. And people, you know, having lived in New York City for over 40 years, everyone always thinks that, you know, New York City, you know, you have to be in New York or you have to be in Los Angeles. You have to be where the action is to make films. And um, I really, um, I, I think there's part of me that really subscribes to John Waters' philosophy or, um, I don't know, people that are interested in subcultures outside of the world that we all know in these cities that we inhabit. And so I just love going into the most, you know, suburban or halcyon kind of world and turning over the rocks. And you often are very surprised and find such interesting things going on that you could never imagine. Joe Exotic with 200 tigers wearing a mullet, you know, with a holster, um, you know, gay as can be. Uh, I just, I just think there's a lot of fertile ground between uh, New York and the and the West Coast. <laughs> it's, it's remarkable that he's a real person. It's, he he's such a character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, people think that it's reality TV, which I right. is, I find so insulting because you know these people are real people and they're a hundred percent a real documentary. Yeah. Um, so first of all, as somebody, I, I'm just curious, as somebody who, who, who was sort of involved in conservation and who had, you had a foundation, I think you still do, um, around for tortoises, how do you kind of, I don't know, how do you kind of process even on Tiger King, you know, working in, in, in seeing these places or, or in the new documentary being around people who are clearly not, um, conservationists yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and yeah. don't uh, have the same kind of ethos around you know, the protection of animals. Yeah, I, I don't want to conflate what I do with conservation with these films because they're really completely, you know, separate. Um, you know, my interest in, you know, these subcultures and people that keep these animals, and it, it, it could be chimps, it could be, you know, tigers, it could be reptiles, it could be, um, you know, tropical fish. Um, I'm interested in obsessions, and I'm interested in just people that have obsessions. Um, I have an obsession with turtles, um, but sometimes obsessions, I, I think, could be a really great thing because it makes you want to wake up in the morning and do the thing that you love. But they can also turn and become, you know, quite um, dark obsessions. But I think there's a balance. But I've always been interested in people that have these obsessions, um, collecting. Um, in the case of the chimpanzee world, it's mostly women that want to have children forever. And, and this obsession to have a child that they can shape and that they can dress like Joan Benet Ramsey, like, like a little pageant doll. Um, and it's this obsession to have a child forever. And there's women that we, uh, filmed in this, uh, chip story that raised their daughter and their chimp at the same time and breastfed both at the same time and they grew up together to you know the chimp and the and their daughter so they treated the mm -hmm. chimp as if it was um their son yeah. um yeah. and so you know that's pretty interesting to me i think that's what drew me to this chimpanzee world and this monkey mom world was that it just was so unusual um, and again, guy, my interest in this has nothing to do with my interest in conservation. It's completely separate. You know, the only yeah. thing that, I mean, obviously in the end, of course, we care about chimpanzees and they're the ones that truly suffer oftentimes, uh, in these stories. And I hope that the films that we make, there is some silver lining in the end, um, and that they're not just, uh, taking you into this world that people don't know, but hopefully, we can make some change. And so I guess, I guess sort of jumping on that, that, that idea, then my assumption would be 
that you're not necessarily judging whether these people are doing the right thing or the wrong thing. I mean, in other words, there are elements and aspects of Joe Exotic that are incredibly sympathetic. They're, they're moments, they're tender moments in the film where you see parts of him that are very likable, even though he's an extremely flawed and narcissistic person in, in other areas. You know, even Carol Baskin, you know, there are parts of her that you, you naturally you wouldn't like and parts of her that you do like, which I, I guess I should say can apply to anybody, any human. So I, I, I wonder if you also take that sort of viewpoint that you're not, you yourself are kind of stepping outside of your own personal you know, viewpoints and perspectives and trying to just say, hey, you know, there's nuance here. There's a lot of gray in this story. Yeah, I think that's well said. I think that I'm not trying to be the animal police. I am trying to enlighten people and obviously document these worlds. And, and, and in that process, I had a lot of empathy for Joe in many ways. And I have a lot of empathy for Tanya Haddix. You know, I actually care very deeply about Tanya Haddix and her um, well-being. Um, and I'm concerned about her life after this show comes out um, because Tanya gave us everything. Um, she um, opened us, let us go into her world and open it up to us in the most intimate ways. Um, and there's so many things about Tanya that are really endearing and lovely. And I just hope through the process of making this documentary series that she might begin to see what other people see, which she can't see right now. And I just hope there's a silver lining in this story that she might have, you know, maybe an epiphany, maybe not, where she maybe will start to recognize that monkeys, chimpanzees, primates in general, most primates, not all, are highly complex social animals that need to be with other animals. They're like us. Um, and to keep a chimpanzee in, sol in a solitary cage, um, as she did, she struggles to see that that may not be good for that chimpanzee, right? And there's this word people use today, you know, anthropom anthropomorphism, Yes. You know, when you read into what your dog thinks of you or what your cat thinks of you, and of course, what your cat really thinks of you, you know, is probably he's hungry. And, you know, let's be, yeah. let's face it, we don't even think, we don't even know what our girlfriend or boyfriend thinks of us half the time. So to think that you know what the chimpanzee feels about you is obviously absurd. But that's what I was dealing with with this story is, is how do I you know, how do I somehow, maybe through the process of making this story, try to get these people to start to understand maybe what they're doing isn't the best thing for that chimpanzee. Um, we'll see what happens. Eric, I wonder if, I mean, this project, right, and, and, and sort of this world that you've kind of maybe by mistake, right, kind of fell into, and, and, and of course you found great success with Tiger King. Um, I wonder if, now, in order to do this kind of work, right, in order to kind of achieve this level of creativity, you kind of have to live this life. You have to immerse yourself in it. I can't imagine that now, probably for the last five years, your whole, most of your time and, and energy and mental energy was thinking about chimpanzees and that world. And before that, it was tigers, right? And whatever it might be in the next iteration, it will be that. Like, do you feel like in order for you to kind of achieve something very special, you you kind of have to shunt everything else aside and you have to, it's almost like being a, a method actor, right? Like you have to dive into that world and just live in that world and be obsessed with it. I, I think that's true. In my case, I, I, I should have said this from the onset, but I have a wonderful team of people that I work with, um, a really talented group of people now uh, making these films. Um, so I don't have to always be doing everything. And so I am able to compartmentalize my life to still do and pursue other projects and other things simultaneously to making these films. 
And, you know, listen, to some degree, and I say this in partially joking, but, you know, it takes one to know one. I do, it comes easy for me because I am an animal person and I have that obsession. In my case, it's tortoises. And I, I'm fortunate enough to have the resources to do a lot of things that these people can't. Um, so, you know, I'm very privileged and lucky in that way, but I can connect with these people very quickly. And um, I would say you're right that you really do need to consume yourself in this. But in my case, at this stage, I can, you know, to some degree, multitask and do other things besides only. Uh, so I wasn't only living this chimp life entirely, although mm -hmm. it was pretty consuming over the last two years, I'd say. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what, you know, I mean, obviously this film we're talking now, it's just out at this moment, but if some, somebody may watch this conversation in a year or two or five, what, what other, I mean, do you want to keep telling stories about these kinds of people? You, earlier you mentioned like people who are obsessive in, in other ways, collectors, or I think of, by the way, like you remember David Isay used to make these documentaries on the radio in the 90s about obsessive people. Right. You know, he made one about about the Bowery, a Bowery hotel, a flop house in the Bowery, on uh, the Sunshine Hotel. Oh, sure, um, sure, of course. Right. He now does um, this other project that is escaping my mind right now, but very, you know, this project about talking to each other. Um, do you? Who do you want to? tell stories about what kind i mean is it obsessives is it is it animals is it uh, what do you think you want to keep keep pursuing you know it's funny you ask that question because i actually was working on a different documentary that was meant to come out before this chimpanzee one and for whatever reason the chimpanzee story is coming out first but i didn't want to come out with something that was so similar in many ways to Tiger King, because obviously, or maybe not so obvious, I don't want to, you know, just make the same thing over and over again, um, just exchanging, you know, chimps with tigers. I I think this story, I, I should ask, have you seen this, the, the film? I, I've seen parts of it so okay. far, yeah. Okay, yeah. so I hope this chimpanzee episodic series is different enough from Tiger King, um, yeah. but, Obviously, there's a lot of parallels. So to answer your question, no, I, I, I'd like to do um, different projects. They don't have to involve animals. Uh, obviously, I'm drawn to eccentric topics, eccentric people. Um, but it, currently, I'm working on a number of different projects, and some of them have nothing to do with the animal world at all. Um, of course, one day, I'd love to do a beautiful film on turtles. Um, and, and just a beautiful film on turtles and showing people the diversity and the, the, the wonder of turtles. Turtles, um, there's only 450 species of turtles and sea turtles and tortoises on the planet. And they're the most endangered group of animals along with primates. Um, and so in terms of extinction risk, turtles are very high up there with over half of all turtles facing extinction. And I'd love to do something uh, that really is a beautiful film about uh, turtles and their uh, biology and everything about them. So um, I, I'd like to do different things, but not only uh, focused on the animal world. I love Errol Morris films. I love, uh, you know, I love The Grizzly Man, which is uh, obviously an animal film. Um, the Hertz, Werner Herzog Hertz, movie. Yeah, I yeah. love Herzog. I, I, I have a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of filmmakers that I think are incredible and I, you know, I look up to. Thinking about about this idea of creativity and, and you know, earlier we, we talked about, you know, your 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 early life as an artist and, and, and quite an, an eccentric artist, let's to say the least, right? I mean, I mean, pinning flies on the wall and geometric patterns is <laughs> certainly, you know, an unusual, um, right, an unusual way to, to play around with mediums. But I wonder, do you... Um, for you, is this is this one of many things that you that you need to do? Like you 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 almost have to do to keep your creativity fired up and and alive. Uh, you know, 
I think maybe so, maybe so. Um, I feel very fortunate um, that, you know, all of these things that I did culminated uh, with Tiger King um, because that wasn't, you know, what I, where I thought I would land. Um, as I said before, I thought I would be making a film about the extinction crisis and it deviated so much. You know, as long as things come my way that are really interesting, I think I will pursue them. Um, and I think it's very important, you know, to not take on too much. So I, I do think, back to what you said before about submersing myself in the chimp world, I do think you really do have to submerse yourself and, and really focus. Um, and, and as you become more successful, the tendency is that people throw more projects your way and it becomes hard to say no. Um, but I think saying no is really important because you can only do so many things well at the same time. It's true. That's true. Um, Eric, thanks so much. Thank you, Guy. Thank you very much for having me. Hey, thanks for watching my conversation with Eric Good. His new four-part series, Chimp Crazy, is now available on HBO Max. If you want to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to this channel. We post new conversations every week. And of course, we are an audio podcast as well. If you want to listen to this show, search for The Great Creators at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Guy Raz, and this has been The Great Creators from Built-In Productions. I'll see you back here next week with a brand new episode. Take care.